Hello, I'm Dr. Pratik Chowdhury and welcome to this topic about how we can use continuous glucose monitoring to reduce or avoid hypoglycemia. These are my disclosures. In this topic, we'll talk about the common patterns that we see in people who are exposed to hypoglycemia and we'll go through some common tricks that can be used to reduce exposure to hypoglycemia. When we use continuous glucose monitoring, we uncover a lot of time at hypoglycemia that you may have not been aware of before. This can lead to some anxiety, whether you're losing your awareness. At the moment, when we look at CGM data from people with and without awareness of hypoglycemia, the time they spent below four seems not to be different. What's different is whether they're recognizing that time or not. And so we can't diagnose impaired awareness of hypoglycemia with CGM, but we certainly have to pay attention to the amount of time people are spending in hypoglycemia. Common ways of assessing hyperglycemia awareness are these two validated scores. There's something called the gold score, which asks a very simple question. How well do you detect the onset of hyperglycemia? Where one means always and seven means never. And if you score one or two, it means that you pick up your hyperglycemia more often than not. And if you're scoring out here between five and seven, then that means that you've got a bit of impaired awareness of hyperglycemia. And people who score at that side have a five to six times higher risk of having a severe hyperglycemic event. Similarly, the Daphne program asks a very simple question. When do you detect your hypos? If you detect it above three, you've got intact awareness. But if you usually detect your hypoglycemia below three or never, then you've got impaired awareness of hypoglycemia. So let's talk a little bit about how you work out if you've had a hypo or if you've got a pattern of hypoglycemia, how you might identify the cause. So one of the key things that we found useful to look at is looking at the balance between your background or basal insulin and the amount of quick acting you take the bolus. If your background insulin is more than 60% and you're having hypoglycemia, it's probable that it's the background causing it and you might think about dropping that down a bit. If your bolus is more than 60%, then it's likely that actually you're doing a lot of correction boluses that are, or correction doses that are causing the hypoglycemia, and you might want to think about that. In particular, hyperglycemia early in the night is often related to correction doses done for your evening meal, whereas hyperglycemia early in the morning or late, later through the night are often related to your background insulin and not reducing it in response to events like alcohol or exercise. With CGM, of course, you get much more warning about hyperglycemia, but it's very easy to overreact to that. So how do you prevent hyperglycemia without causing hyperglycemia? So if you see a blood glucose dropping and you're below six millimoles per liter, and the arrow on your CGM device is showing a downward trend, it might be worthwhile thinking, why is it dropping? Have I done some exercise? Have I taken a big correction dose? Is there any insulin on board? That is, have I taken a shot of quick acting insulin in the last two to three hours? In which case that's still likely to be driving my glucose down for the next hour. And finally, have I done some recent exercise that has caused the glucose to drop further? And then it's really important not to overcorrect. We have a very simple rule we use in our clinic that if you've got, if your sugar's below six with a single arrow down, just take one jelly baby. And if it's below six with two arrows down, take two jelly babies and then have a look where you are in the next 10 or 15 minutes and if you're still dropping you can repeat that. Now this is quite a busy slide and it's been covered in one of the previous presentations but in case you're just looking at this one I think it was important to look at this. The arrows actually mean something slightly different with the different systems and I want to focus on the bottom level of that slide. As you can see if you've got um, an oblique arrow down in a Dexcom or a one arrow down with a Minimed uh, Medtronic system if you look across the mean, it means that you're going to drop by one millimole per litre in about 15 minutes. Or in another way, in about half an hour, you're going to go down by three. So if your blood glucose is about seven and you had that arrow, it's probably worth checking again in about 15 minutes. If you've got the straight arrow down on the Dexcom or a double arrow down on the Medtronic system, that means you're falling a bit faster and you're going to fall by one in seven minutes. And so that's probably about the time when you should be looking again to make sure how the treatment you've taken stopped the fall. And then the Dexcom, the Medtronic system has a triple arrow down system as well, which means you're going to fall by one in, in even less than five minutes. And so that probably might need a little bit more treatment um, at an earlier level. So let's just talk a little bit about how we use the alerts on continuous glucose monitoring. Most systems will have a low alert, which you can set at a certain level, and it will tell you when you reach that. But most systems also have a predictive alert which tells you 20 or 30 minutes before you hit that number. 
So it's important to think about the fact that uh, what sort of sugar level would that alarm go off on? So if you set your low alert at something like 3.5 millimoles per litre, which is about the average people set it at, if you're dropping by one arrow, which means, as we said before, by one millimole in 15 minutes, it's going to go off about one and a half or two millimoles higher than where you set it. So if you set it at 3.5, you're going to get an alert at about 5.5. Okay, so while that might seem that the glucose is okay, it means within 15 minutes you might be in hypoglycemia. That's an alert now, act now to avoid that low alert level. If you're dropping a bit faster with a double arrow down, you're going to hit the low level. You're going to drop by one millimole in only seven minutes. So actually the alert goes off a little bit higher. So if you've set your low alert at 3.5, your predictive alert is going to go off somewhere around about six or 6.5 millimoles per litre. Again, because you're dropping rapidly, it's important to act to treat that hyper at that level and not wait for it to drop down because it's falling that much faster. On the other end, of course, it's important to know where to set your high alerts as well. Because if you set that too low, you're going to get a lot of alerts and you might not want to act on those because it'll just be beeping all the time. It might be annoying. So a phrase we use in our clinic a lot is that every alert should lead to an action. And certainly some suggested levels would be if your HbA1c is over 9% and you're on that journey of trying to bring it down, try and set it at 18 millimoles per litre. And when it goes off, have a thought, is it because I've treated a hypo? I'm a post-meal. If you're using an insulin pump, is it because I've had a problem with my pump set? Try and think about why you're up there. If your HbA1c is between 7.5 and 9%, that high alert might be better set at somewhere around about 14 to 16 millimoles per litre. You're averaging a bit lower when you get up to 14 or 16. It's something out of the usual. Is something you want to be told about and act on. And as the A1C drops down, um, you can drop that high alert down to between 12 and 13 and act a bit lower. The lower that high alert is, the lower your A1C is um, in general. So let's look at that pattern we talked about and think how having an alert might affect it. So now you've got your CGM, you've got your high alert. At that point, if, especially if it's within an hour after a meal, you might feel compelled to take some more insulin, but it's important to remember not to. Because if you take insulin at that point, it's only going to drive that drop more faster. And you can see that on the slide, it says more rapid fall because you now stacked your insulin. And if you do take that extra insulin within that first hour, you'll almost certainly need to treat the hyper down the other end. Now, as you see, if you have treated and made a correction and your blood glucose is dropping rapidly, you will get that alert. And in this sort of picture here, you can see that glucose is dropping with a double arrow down. So around about 6.5 millimoles per litre, you'll get that predicted hypo alert. At that point, it's important to remember, if you do your normal hypo treatment, which is 15 grams of carbohydrate, you know, half a glass of orange juice, that's a U-turn. That's a dose of carbohydrate that's supposed to bring you out of a hypo. But at this scenario with CGM, you're not yet at hypo. I always imagine this as though you're in the middle lane, you're pointing towards the barrier, but not hitting it. You want to make a subtle judgment back into the middle lane, a small correction, um, because you want to avoid bouncing back up again and leading to a situation where you're going to have to treat it again. So smaller doses required because you're, it's a dab of the brakes rather than a U-turn. And these are just some examples where you can see exactly what I was talking about. This is a scenario where a person, the top one, where someone has done some exercise, caused a rapid double arrow down, they've had the predictive alert, they've taken their carbohydrate and they've stopped the glucose falling. But because they had some exercise on board, you can see there, actually they got repeated alerts along the way and they had to take quite a lot of carbohydrate to, to prevent hypoglycemia. The second example is where someone has been running high. This looks like maybe their set was displaced or they'd had a very high glucose. Um, they'd corrected it down. You can see there, they'd taken an appropriate amount of carbohydrate to stop that very rapid fall. It has turned up, but they've avoided rebounding back up. Later on, you can see the glucose has been dropping a bit more gently. That alert would have come on at a glucose of five, very close, and would only require a very small amount of carbohydrate to keep them between that middle lane, between that four and 10. This is just on the side, left side here, you can see an example where you can see someone has had a prolonged nighttime hypoglycemia. It's quite important to remember, actually, that sometimes these long overnight hypoglycemic episodes might occur if you're sleeping on the sensor. And sometimes it becomes difficult to differentiate between what we call sensor compression artifact and what is real hypoglycemia. And you might want to think back and think, ah, did I take too much background insulin? Did I do a lot of exercise the previous day? Did I drink any alcohol? In which case it's more likely to be hypoglycemia um, if not. See on the side here, I've got another example of someone 
having a bolus for their meal, they were already high and they went higher. They took an extra shot of insulin against what the bolus wizard was advising them. This caused hyperglycemia. They didn't have a predictive alert on, so actually they only got alerted when they got to the hypoglycemic level and they overtreated it. Bounced back up high, that resulted in more correction back down to hypoglycemia. So when you're hypoglycemic, there's often a temptation of eating, eating, eating. And I, and I really understand when you are low, it's very difficult to limit that. If you are very low, and you can see here this person was low for a large part of the night, must have felt very um, confused and, uh, and, uh, and unpleasant, and overtreated their hypoglycemia, you can see went up past 20. On the other side, you've got that example again, where they're just microcarbing and that's helping them keep uh, glucose within the range. And so reacting to that predictive low alert when you're still between six and four before you hit the hypo and having small amounts of carb becomes really important in using the CGM appropriately. I would like to um, use this slide to demonstrate what a perfect um, shot of insulin is. And so whenever you're choosing how much insulin to take before your meal, it's a bit like teeing off on the golf course and you look at the amount of carbohydrates you have, you look at what your blood glucose is, and you're aiming for that flag you can see in the distance at a glucose of 5.5 or 6 millimoles per litre. But actually, trying to get that glucose every time is a bit like hitting a hole in one every time. It just ain't gonna happen. And even if you're absolutely perfect at carb counting, even if you and your healthcare team have judged your carb ratio and your sensitivity factor to perfection, when you hit that shot, there's about a four or 5% chance that it's gonna hit the sand bunker. And if it hits the sand bunker, life is gonna be crazy for a, for a while until it settles down. On the other hand, even though you've dosed insulin correctly, stress, life, activity, lots of things can get in the way and you might end up a bit short and might have to do a correction on board. That correction isn't gonna be a full shot, it's gonna be a nudge back onto the green. And the really good players, the people who get their HbA1c between six and a half and 7%, the sort of levels that will allow you to live a long, complication-free life with diabetes are getting about 65 to 70% of their time between that four to 10. They're allowed to have about 5% in the green in hypoglycemia, and they're even getting 30% that's gonna stay on the high side. 30% of a day is about eight hours, and you could argue that's your allowance when things go off piste. You've gotta find it and pull it down, and we're always gonna try and help you minimize that amount, but if it's there between seven to eight hours a day, you can still maintain a glucose level that will leave you complication free. So common patterns um, that we see in our clinic where we look after people with lots of problematic hypoglycemia are generally in three or four key areas. The first is if you've got too much background insulin. So if we add up all your insulin, all your background and all your quick acting, we call that your total daily dose. And if background makes up more than 60% of that, and you're having hypos, it's likely the hypos are being caused by the background insulin. If the background insulin is less than 30%, then a lot of your insulin is coming from corrections and quick acting. And it means maybe pushing up the background and balancing those out might help reduce your hypoglycemia. It's also important to look at the balance between background, correction, and bolus insulin. And a good guide that we use is we, is for your insulin to carb ratio is total daily dose divided by 350. And for correction, it's total 120 divided by total daily dose. What that means is for an average person, maybe someone my size, who you'd expect to be on about 40 units of insulin, an expected background total daily dose would be about 20 units a day. And their expected sensitivity, uh, insulin to carb, their expected insulin to carb ratio would be 350 divided by 40, around about 8.7. And their expected correction dose would be 120 divided by 40, which is three. So I hope you enjoyed that topic, uh, and by this time you should be able to recognize some common patterns that increase the risk of hypoglycemia and some tricks that can be used to reduce the exposure to hypoglycemia. So thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the other modules in the series.